Well, good morning. Uh, this is Ian R. Crane here, just about 100 meters or so away from the Third Energy, or it's Barclays Bank, trading as Third Energy uh, here in North Yorkshire. So, as you can see, uh, there's a whatever the collective noun is that a prick, a prick of security guards, or something like that. I'm not sure what the noun is. Anyway, uh, they are very, very nervous. A busload of security came in last night. And uh, um, this uh, perhaps is uh, in response to a very high level of internet chatter, which uh, predicts that um, Greg Clark may actually sign off on Barclays Bank's application to frack here at Kirby Misperton in North Yorkshire. So it seems that uh, uh, some of them are a bit camera shy. They're walking away along the back of the berm and uh, just left uh, a singular, um, whatever the singular noun is. <laughs> Maybe it's not a prick, I don't know. But uh, anyway, the singular noun for security guards uh, to watch over me and uh, uh, hang on to my every word, no doubt. Anyway, let me come the other side of the camera now. So this is, literally the cusp the kit has been sitting here for three weeks and uh, that's obviously costing Barclays Bank a pretty penny but it's a real sort of drop in the ocean it's a small change to them and the fact that uh, they are here trading as third energy which is deep in the financial doo-doo there is no possibility of third energy ever paying tax so effectively this is a bit of a tax scam for Barclays Bank and we know that this whole industry is a Ponzi scheme anyway once it kicks off they just have to keep on looking for new well sites drilling new wells fracking new wells uh, to to keep the uh, illusion running that uh, you know it's an industry that's actually got a, a future and can generate cash yet you don't have to look too hard to find that the bankruptcies associated with this industry particularly in North America uh, where of course it's touted as the uh, saviour to the national economy I don't think uh, much could be further from the truth um, but uh, the reality is that once you scratch beneath the surface what you find isn't very pretty so if if Greg Clark does decide that he's going to uh, put his political career on a proverbial knife edge by signing off on this then I would counsel that people from right across the north of England as I said last week my calculation is that some 13 million people across this part of the country from the Lancashire coast right across the North Yorkshire well Yorkshire coast right down into uh, Lincolnshire will potentially be living uh, within the proverbial spit of a frack pad and uh, you know we the evidence just keeps on giving and uh, in fact, I posted on Twitter an article this morning that's from exactly five years ago where farmers in North Dakota, up around the Bucken Shale play there, were starting to uh, report that their livestock were uh, dying and suffering from uh, debilitating diseases. And you know, those who believe that that won't happen here are naive because it's pretty much happened everywhere else. So. Of those 13 million people, obviously, there are a number of those, unfortunately, probably quite a significant number, that uh, are just not interested. They have their heads buried deep in the uh, proverbial sand. But for those who are starting to become aware of the bigger picture and become aware that basically the government really doesn't give a flying frack about what you, the uh, constituent, thinks, they will simply plough ahead. So if you want to see what's likely to be coming on your doorstep, then perhaps take a trip up to here to Kirby Mispleton or across here, because nowhere in this area across the north of England is more than 90 minutes, a max two hours from Kirby Mispleton. And uh, believe you me, once you witness a frack, then you will be newly motivated to try to ensure and do whatever it takes to make sure it doesn't rock up in your community. So, you know, it, it's gonna be uh, half a day or a day out of your time, but that day 
will be well worthwhile and let me assure you that future generations will greatly appreciate your uh, your efforts by the way let me also say that uh, unfortunately last week after i proposed the idea that uh, uh, saturday 2nd of december should start the new campaign to raise awareness that this is barclays bank trading as third energy that are looking to initiate this uh, first frack and of course barclays pulled off a very very significant pr coup earlier this year in fact uh, six months ago in uh, mid-may where they announced that oh actually you know we're trying to divest uh, ourselves we're trying to sell uh, third energy no they're not but it worked brilliantly because the rising campaign right across the country where people were uh, going into or outside of Barclays banks to let their customers know what Barclays were financing uh, came to a halt. So everyone went, oh, that's great. They're going to sell it. But no, they're not. Absolutely not. This is Barclays Bank trading as third energy. And don't let anything deter you from that. And of course, you know, take a bit of a look at Barclays history because, you know, the Barclays family made their money on the back of slavery. So, you know, this is a bank, like pretty much all of the banks, that has no ethics and that uh, they will do whatever it is that they think they can get away with to uh, enhance their obscene profits. So let's just take a look at what will happen here if Greg Clark loses or succumbs to the phenomenal pressure that's clearly you know, being put upon him uh, to sign off on this. And as I you know, have acknowledged, you know, Greg Clark is reckoned to be one of the smartest guys on the cabinet. He's uh, quite a young guy. I think he's uh, about 50 or so. Uh, so he's you know, potentially got a uh, bright political future ahead of him. Unless, of course, he signs off on this and, as expected, at some point, wherever that might be, the whole thing, the whole house of cards comes tumbling down and uh, his political career will be on the rocks because he will be forever associated with the decision to uh, kick this industry off despite all the evidence from pretty much everywhere in the world suggesting that's a pretty bad idea. And like we said before, this is just a test frack and the pad here is absolutely rammed. It's unsafe. And last week, the new suffragettes uh, raised their concerns with the councillors at uh, uh, North Yorkshire County Council in Pickering, uh, in, uh, sorry, in North Allerton. And uh, basically they're like, well, we don't know. We don't know. We assumed that somebody else was looking at this. Well, that's exactly what happened. And the Environment Agency seemed to be distancing themselves from this industry. And in fact, the Environment Agency have uh, recently published a, a document which effectively lays out what they are not responsible for. Normally, they tend to say what they are responsible for and leave the rest blank. But they're now starting to actually spell out what they are not responsible for. And, uh, you know, what we have is the regulatory bodies going, well, actually, it's him. And they go, no, 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 it's him. And uh, the company's going, well, you know, we'll just send the reports in as agreed on a Friday afternoon. But, you know, it's up to you what you do with it. So, you know, the gold standard regulatory control, which we've always known is totally... Myth, total mythology then uh, you know it's now starting to uh, fall down around Greg Clark's ears let's take a look at what would happen here because this is a test track and uh, again if they wanted to go to production they're likely going to have to go through the whole process of getting planning permission to extend this pad because um, it's rammed at the moment with uh, I think 19 uh, um, frack tanks each with a capacity of I think something in the region uh, about 20,000 uh, gallons or so and in fact um, the first frack which is at a depth of 9,964 feet um, or down to 9,984 feet so the frack zone in each case is just 20 feet but um, at that uh, depth they are going to be pumping 1,321 cubic meters of frac fluid. And that's uh, 290,000 gallons. Well, 290,676 to be precise. But uh, that's uh, a fair chunk of water. So that's pretty much going to take 
the entire stock from the 19 tanks that they have here on site. So once they've run that first frack, then obviously they have to completely replenish all of the fluids, the water, in the frack tanks. Now, Third Energy acknowledge that they are only going to get back something between 40 and 60%. And in fact, we know that uh, a frack master considers it to be an exceptional frack job if they get back just 40% of what they pump down the hole. So where does the other 60% go? Well, we have a very interesting quote from the technical manager of Quadrilla, who, uh, when asked that question, basically said, well, we have no idea. And, and that, really, that's, that's the problem. Where does it go? Because as we know elsewhere in the world, it's ended up um, in adjoining geology or in aquifers or seeped out, uh, you know, some distance away into the surface, which is one of the reasons why this industry has uh, rejected the idea of putting dyes in with their frac fluid for close on two decades. So if they get 40 to 60%, but let's say they get uh, 50%, let's split the difference between what they say they're gonna get back. That means that they're gonna get back about 145,000 gallons of flowback water. Well, it's not just water, is it? Because it's not only the chemicals that they added to the solution, but it's also the debris that uh, the fracking process uh, drags out of the geology. And they're gonna bring that back to the surface and then they say they're going to dispose of it, but they don't say actually where, they just say an approved facility. But that means that they've got to truck off about 140,000 gallons or so. That's probably about eight, nine tankers worth. But they've got to get that away from here and get that to a waste treatment facility. Now there's only two that I'm aware of in the uh, northeast of England, and one is at Nostrop in Leeds, and the other one is the Northumbrian water facility at Brand Sands just outside uh, Redcar on uh, Teesside. So if you live in those communities, i.e. Uh, Nostrop or Brand Sands, then you are potentially the target for the frac waste. And if we go back to what occurred at Priest Hall, um, you know, it's nearly seven years ago now, where United Utilities had the contract for removing the frac waste, but uh, actually it was beyond their capability. So they quietly pumped something between 800,000, 2 million gallons of the treated fluids into the Manchester Ship Canal without any third party oversight, and then distributed the solids around other facilities, desperate to try and find a company that had a process to deal with these toxic solids. So it shouldn't be any great surprise that all of the companies and the regulatory bodies have been extremely reluctant to discuss the process by which this waste will be treated and disposed of. Of course, the other option that Third Energy have is to pump it into the adjoining well. KMA um, or the reinjection well that they have just up the road in uh, Pickering. And if you want to see what reinjection has done, then just take a look at Oklahoma, where uh, it's become the reinjection capital uh, in the United States. And over the last uh, nine years or so, Oklahoma has also become the earthquake capital of the United States. Once upon a time, that was the um, uh, recognition of California. Now it's Oklahoma. So after they've done that first frack, got rid of the waste somewhere, then they go to the second stage. Now this is uh, smaller. Uh, it's a little bit uh, shallower. It's 9,056 feet to 9,076 feet. And they'll be pumping 170,000 gallons on that stage. So that takes up about 11 tanks of uh, fluids. Then they've obviously got a well, maybe they don't have to replenish that because the next stage is uh, the third stage, which is 8,699 feet down to 8,719 feet. And that's 115,000 gallons. So actually they could do stages two and three, provided there's no waste, uh, with the 19 tanks that they've got here. And then they would have to replenish them once again for stages four and five. 
And stage four is 7,370 feet to 7,390 feet. That's 106,000 gallons. And then the final stage is at 6,965 feet down to 6,985 feet. And they need seven tanks for the 102,000 gallons. Now, what is interesting about these numbers is that only the first stage of pumping um, 170,000 gallons, only that first stage would actually be, uh, sorry, 2,000, uh, 290,000 gallons, only that first stage would be recognized as a frack under the political definition of a hydraulic fracture as per the Infrastructure Act of 2015. And of course, as I'm sure many of you watching are aware, then the Infrastructure Act was subsequently amended so that basically anything could be disposed down these uh, deep boreholes uh, without any further consultation with the local community. And as I've alluded to, and on numerous occasions in the past, there is the distinct possibility that the work of Professor Fergus Gibb at uh, Sheffield University looking into the deep borehole disposal of toxic nuclear waste may actually be the real agenda here. So this is likely to be the first frack if Greg Clark signs it off whenever. Um, there are apparently a couple of uh, legal challenges that are in the process of being mounted which will hopefully delay a little further and give Greg Clark perhaps more time to reflect on the magnitude of this decision because you know if we have a situation like in southern Queensland which it was the Darling Downs similar to this in terms of prime agricultural land but is now effectively a wasteland and that's you know, an area the size of England in a state that's seven times the size of the, the UK. So they may just dismiss it as the sacrifice zone that it is. So uh, please, please keep uh, an ear to the ground on what Greg Clark is doing because Third Energy, Barclays Bank, will want to start firing up the pumps almost immediately he grants that permission. As I say, this kit's been sitting here for three weeks. Uh, there's obviously been a frat crew hanging around in the area somewhere for the last three weeks waiting on the go ahead. And uh, well, you know, who, who knows? Maybe they've already got the, the nod that they'll be compensated by the government for any delay caused as a result of the government delaying its decision. So in which, if that's the case, they're happy to sit here for you know, as long as it takes. Well, I would like to think that that isn't the case and that uh, you know this is a risk that is being picked up by Barclays Bank. Now, last week, uh, some pro-frackers who were listening in, but only with half an ear uh, to the live stream, uh, picked up that I had made the observation that Ineos is owned by Barclays Bank. Of course, that's not what I said. Uh, Ineos is owned by Jim Ratcliffe. It is a private company, no third party oversight, no shareholder oversight, a private company. But uh, that said, um, it, Jim Ratcliffe has certainly proved himself to be the master of managing corporate debt. And uh, actually, there's not that many banks that aren't into Ineos in some way, shape or form. And as, as is often acknowledged, you know, if um, you owe the bank uh, 3000, then um, uh, uh, the bank are your problem. But uh, if you owe them 300 million or 3 billion or whatever, then uh, you know, you're know you the bank's problem and they're gonna do whatever they can to uh, keep you sweet. So Jim Ratcliffe has dug a massive debt hole, obviously backed by the assets of Ineos, but uh, meanwhile, of course, uh, raking in a significant personal fortune in excess of five billion pounds. And uh, just seeing here, we've got the tankers going in with a police escort. You can just see that over the hedge there in the distance. So right on schedule here at about uh, 8.45 or so. So um, these will be topping up the, uh, the frack tanks. So I still only have my lone security guard here 
on the uh, corner of the well site. But uh, hopefully, once, assuming Greg Clark signs off on this, we need a lot of people to be standing here and witnessing this, recording it, taking the video, recording the soundtracks, because there's only 8,000 horsepower here on this well site. If this industry does get into production, it's going to be a lot more than 8,000 uh, horsepower. But the residents of Kirby Misperton and uh, some of the adjoining farms here will get a taste of what it sounds like when these pumps are ramped up and pumping these fluids down at enormous pressure to uh, create what is effectively likely to be uh, a quite minimal gas flow. Anyway, that's pretty much about it from me today. Uh, I was supposed to be joined by Eddie Thornton today, who's just come back from uh, a week's break. Uh, unfortunately, Eddie and a couple of others um, managed to get themselves uh, arrested last night. Now, as I said, you know, a busload of security came down yesterday. Uh, so it seems that uh, you know, they're very nervous, which might indicate that they know something about what Greg Clark is due to announce later today. Now, please share this. Uh, thank you for watching right through, but please share it because it is on a different uh, Facebook profile than, uh, than previous and I don't have uh, the capacity to share quite so widely from uh, this profile. So please help uh, share this around and let's try to ensure that uh, as wider a uh, population as is possible comprehends what is about to be unleashed here by Barclays Bank trading as uh, Third Energy. And I'll be back hopefully with uh, Eddie Thornton alongside me uh, tomorrow morning at 8.30.